You're listening to the Comic Crusaders Podcast. I am your host, Al Mega, CEO of Comic Crusaders and Undercover Capes. In this show, I'm sitting down with creators from all walks of life to talk about inspiration, process, the lessons they've learned, and a whole lot more. Wepa, what up, me gente? It's your boy Al Mega. Welcome to a brand new Comic Crusaders podcast. And today we have an awesome return guest. Got a brand new Kickstarter out there that we're going to be talking about. He's an author, an illustrator, and just a kick ass human being. The one, the only, Mitsa, Richard Fregway. Wepa, how you doing, bro? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back, kiddo. How you been? I have been amazing. Um, like life has been absolute fucking chaos for the past. I mean, it's what like a year since I spoke to you. Yeah, it's been a, um, a year exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Life has been chaos. Uh, everything in the world is chaos as always. But um, <laughs> right now, I'm like back in my office in Hollywood, my favorite place to be, what I like to call my fuck palace, um, and <laughs> just, just like, I, I don't know. I'm operating at this level of like like 21 hours a day awake uh, to get my shit done. So. It's like the best oh, feeling man. in the world. I'm like in a constant so slumber party with all my characters. Gotcha. And I see now, folks, you see this explains why he has the creamer like hair because he's just frazzled all the time. Man is not getting sleep over here. <laughs> well, I see, like when when like shit is calm, I do this thing called polyphasic sleep, where you do like different patterns of sleep uh, to try and kind of activate your brain as much as possible. Oh, and man. I've tried to get to the point of doing like a series of 20 minute naps over each 24 hour period, and that was like pretty good um and then when i'm like very relaxed i'll do two three hour blocks of sleep each day oh, okay interesting yeah the key is never get like either never get into full deep sleep just get that quick little mm -hmm. dip in dip out keep your feet higher than your head while you're sleeping or borrow someone's cpap machine out without telling them because obviously they get kind of squicked out if they know it's been in your nose <laughs> uh, and you get like flooded with oxygen in that 20 minutes but if you're going to do like any kind of normal sleep, always every single person should do this. Do it in 90 minute uh, multiple multiples, right? Because that's basically when your body goes like into deep sleep and then back out takes about 90 minutes. So if you like get woken up after like four hours, you're at your deepest point of sleep and you'll get that like huh, huh, feeling, you know, when you're yeah. like nothing's good. But if you just like drift out after 90 minutes, you're like, oh, man, I feel like I've had a great time. Really? Okay, I gotta try this stuff, man. Can't wait. I'm gonna be having my own bachelor pass soon, so we'll be able to then, then practice that. Cause right now I get no peace. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. All right, but again, you said you're a cat. So, how did the last project go before we get into the, into this new one? How was that last project that you did, and, and how did that even then get you, you know, inspired to start working and getting onto a new project? Well, so everything um, had kind of been coming to a head. I, I released Haunted Hill last year. And it was like this, it was this very, it was this big messy thing because like I'd been doing exclusively all ages content for five or six years at that point. And most people in the US didn't know anything about my previous work, which was like more adult, um, like not, not pornographic adult. Although I've, I've worked in porn <laughs> quite a bit in comics, um, but I actually had to stop because I released a, a picture book and I was at a book signing for it. And a, a parent said, I recognize your line work. Do you do the art on? uh name redacted uh bear porn uh, and i was like no absolutely i don't do that so i had to stop doing that while i was doing kids books um apparently my line work is distinctive though which is like an amazing compliment so, <laughs> yeah yeah you have your signature man <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i was um it, it all comes down to the kinds of pens you use honestly uh i'm not good at line work i just have a good pen i um a a, a, a a, a terrible artist blames their tools or thanks their tools. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so i had been doing like kids content with like Blastosaurus and Black Sand Beach and another one that I won't name that because I, I hate it. Um, yeah. And I was getting really miserable. So I started doing making uh, Haunted Hill in my spare time. And I was like, this is actually my favorite thing I've ever done. And I thought I have to release this. I have to take some control because I've been stuck in Canada at that point for about a year and a half um, or mm -hmm. no, about a year because of COVID. And I thought I have to do like this has to be on me from now on. And so I launched that and I started doing like a lot of press for it. And I was doing a lot of interviews. And then because of the way that like the book market publishing happens, like a lot of the press is done like six to eight months in advance and then released. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting a lot of overlap in which interviews I was doing or what book they were for. 
And so I would always ask the interviewer right before we went on just to double check, is this for a kid's book or is this for my like big sloppy Hollywood story about like the Venn diagram of misogyny and homophobia that has like a woman whose job is to be a cleaner at my favorite sex club. And I'm doing this one interview and it's a live stream. And uh, I, I didn't ask, but right before we went on, the interviewer said, by the way, I've been reading Haunted Hill and I fucking love it. And I thought he was doing that thing where, like, some interviewers will, like, not have read your stuff. And he was uh, kind of letting me know that he had read the thing we were talking about. Right. Yeah. So I was like, cool, I'm good to go. His first question is um, A lot of the places in your series are based on real places. What's your favorite? And so I said, Oh, well, Slam Town, where Eva works, is based on Slammer. It's this prison themed sex club over on Beverly. Um, which uh, has a senior discount on Sunday. So obviously it's like a fucking smorgasbord of dicks for me. And I really, um, you know, like the, their big claim to fame, of course, is that they have the longest sockatorium in Southern California and the host just stares at me. And so I assume his staring is to say, what's a sockatorium? And I said, a sockatorium yeah. is like a whole line of glory holes <laughs> or maybe just like an area with bars. <laughs> oh my God. But the thing about Slammer's one is that it's split level so that the people who are getting sucked off can walk up higher and stick their dicks through. And the people on the other side oh can be like upright while they're sucking, which is great because you don't want to be on your knees in a place like this because the floor gets pretty fucking gooshy. Oh my God. And at that point, the guy says, OK, but your series Cardboardia that we're here to talk about. And I'm like, fuck, because this oh is like my a live God. stream. It's, and it's a live stream to like librarians. Right. So. <laughs> And the thing is, you know, I, I didn't, it, it was a genuine mistake on my part. Like I, I, I overshare a lot and I don't have much of an understanding of what people are going to think is normal. And I spend a lot of my time just staring at people going, what, what did I say wrong? But I was coming away from a lot of interviews with like, oh no, oh God, I fucked up. I fucked up somehow. And then like, it, but it had never happened. And then it did. And I was like, oh, that's kind of freeing. Okay. I'm not doing any more interviews. I'm not doing any more publicity for kids book stuff. I just need to like take control of this. Yeah. And then I was having some problems with um, my, my publisher because they were like, they kept sort of talking about how my book was the highest selling book they had, but they were also taking, my editor was taking like eight to 11 months to respond to a two page synopsis. And what? then like, like, and just like, you know, you can't start the script until the synopsis is approved. I send off a two page synopsis. I get a two sentence thing 11 months later that just says, uh, love this full stop. You're good to go. And I'm like, okay, so I'll start writing the script. It's going to take a month or two. And then I get an email the next day saying, can you have finished art for us by the end of the month? I'm like, no, it's a 192 page book. And you didn't approve. <laughs> like, I will have a, a script for you in a month and a half if you're lucky. And it was just this constant thing of like, I was as the person creating the book that's going to make them the money that they have had option for television, mm -hmm. uh, that I am not like being consulted on in any way. Uh, the person actually making this is the person being treated the worst. Um, they like literally, I sent in an expense report for a convention appearance from November 2021, and they paid me the money last week. What? So yeah, it's just it's just like complete lack of respect and i think a lot of people are we're really trained as creators to like feel like we owe everyone everything and you should just be grateful to get to draw pictures or whatever the fuck and no, I'm, I'm just no. like yeah i'm 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 an adult i'm a fully grown adult and i'm 37 years old i don't have time for this shit and then um and also like i've been in self-publishing for 30 years at this point i put my first book out when i was seven i have done every part oh, of this wow. and what it comes out down to is like I can do all of the jobs that you're taking 11 months to do and I can do my job too. And that's the difference. And like I made more money in self-publishing than I do from, from the book market and the book market is always set up to screw you. The number of times that I've had contracts where publishers will say you get this level of royalty unless it's sold through say a book club, in which case your royalty is cut in half, but the numbers are so much bigger that it sort of is meant to work out. But then yeah. what they do is they sell the books to their own book club, which are a separate entity, but still from within the company. So they can then sell the books at full price and the, and I get half the royalty I'm meant to get. Like there's so much sneaky Ooh. shit like this going on. Wow. And like obviously everyone That's grimy. Has 
yeah, it is. It's 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 gross. And like everyone's seen the shit that came out last year about actual books, like the numbers of books that sell, like 90% of books sell fewer than 12 copies. And like the publishing industry has worked so hard to keep that secret. And then on top of all of that, uh, my like one of my best friends in the entire world died. And um, oh, I'm sorry. He was, I mean, he was he was it's, it's fine. He was like 89. So like it wasn't a massive shock. But he was this yeah. dude who I like. I met through SilverDaddies.com, where they still use Java Chat. It's a great site, and it had mostly been like webcam sex for the first like six months, and then we became real life friends. I went to stay with him a bunch of times. We went on road trips together. Like we were like very close. I'm now like very good friends with his grandson. I know his family. Like it's it's a it's a yeah. weird balance to strike because there's a lot of stories that I don't want them to know. Um, but. <laughs> he was this like unapologetic dirtbag his entire life, like super nice guy. Everything he did was done with absolute kindness. One of the smartest men I've known, but like he never filtered himself. And I, I just love that about mm. him. And then I'm looking at myself and I'm like feeling guilty for doing interviews wrong. And like, then, you know, obviously then I get in my own head. So I start doing worse. You know, if you feel like you're having a bad conversation, you drink more to feel comfortable. Then the next day you're like, shit, I was on a, I was on a, I was on a Twitter space the other night. Um, because I'd, I'd been invited to be one of the guest judges at a fisting competition and I didn't feel like it because I was just <laughs> fucking tired. And I don't like I don't know how to judge a fisting competition competition. Like is it depth? Is it enthusiasm? And so I, I didn't sure. want to go. So I jumped on a Twitter space with some friends and I was talking to them and I was drinking some whiskey to kind of encourage myself not to leave my office. And I just remember getting halfway through a story where the details were James Cameron and 9-11. And I don't know what that story is because I don't, I don't like, there's nothing that I don't even know. I just remember saying it and then losing track of my thoughts. Maybe I was making a joke. Maybe I had read something. <laughs> oh, fuck. I just remember what it is. Oh, shit. I know what it is. Okay. It's not as bad as I thought. Oh, that's such a huge relief. There's the, um, one of the documentaries that Cameron did between Titanic and Avatar where he went back to the Titanic. There's this bit where they lose uh, the robots that are like, um, not flying because they're in water. What's it? Water. It's still swimming. Swimming into. Yeah. I'm the smartest person you know. Um, I know <laughs> the world. Um, one of the one of the robots that they lost them, and so James Cameron jumps on the thing. He's like, "I'll I'll see if I can rescue them." And he gets on the sub with his like thing. He's like, "Oh, it's just like flying a helicopter." And you're like, "Fuck you, James Cameron." Um, <laughs> and he he rescues the thing, and then he's like, he comes back and he's doing his little piece to camera, and he says, um. This is, uh, we did so well today and we did something that really mattered. This is a day that we will never forget, September 11th, 2001. And it's like, yeah, okay, you're in a submarine, you don't know, but like cut that from the documentary. You can cut those yeah, phrases you know. before you say that number. And it's <laughs> just, it's the funniest thing. Um, wow. I'm so glad I remember what that story was because I've been like really tormented by that all week. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, so you get in your head and then you, try and apologize and you make it worse and you're just cycling and cycling and cycling. Um, and when I would talk about Haunted Hill, I didn't have that. And then when Jim died, uh, there was a couple of things that happened. Uh, his grandson called me after the memorial and was like really angry because the family had not talked about anything that was like really about Jim at the memorial. Like that introduced his boyfriend as his close friend. It was like yeah. that kind of regressive shit. Um, mm. But what made it really worthwhile was that the picture they used for his obituary was his profile picture from Silver Daddies. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh shit. Yeah. That so was... that that like I've now just been I'm finishing off a couple of books and I'm still under contract for. I'll do what I have to do, uh, and I'll deliver amazing books because it turns out I'm very fucking good at this. But I am now like from this point forward, I have turned down a bunch of uh, offers from publishers. I'm working with some indie publishers who are incredible. Fanbase Press are putting out a graphic novel by me this year. Uh, called Fanbase Rocks, Heroes. yeah. Barbara yeah, Dillon, and, shout out. <laughs> and then um, uh, Blue Fox Comics put out my book, Shed, last year. They're fantastic to work with. Um, but yeah, basically, the Richard Sucks imprint is going to be putting out four books this year and then on and on and on forever. Oh, snap. Congrats. That's it, bro. Thank Going you. on your own. So salute to you, homie. That's dope. And let's talk about, you know, one of these projects you've been working on. The reason yeah. that you're here, kiddo, yes. on this uber, super, already funded project with still 29 days to go. Congrats for a stop, Thank homie. You. Amazing. 104 backers. 
You, you smashed it already. So that's nice. That we've, we've, we've had two backers since I've been on here. That's good. Oh, beautiful. So check this out. Let's throw, let's throw on the, uh, the video and see what it's all about. Hi, I'm Richard Fairbray, the writer and artist on these books, the proud owner of this sick hamburger costume, and the mind behind this top quality tweet. Octopus is my memoir. It is a revealing, vulnerable comic memoir about me flailing my way through a divorce, abusive relationships, toxic friendships, breakups, sex clubs, drinking, moving to Hollywood, maybe meeting someone nice, all while I'm trying to be a good person, make comics, and not turn into an octopus myself. Three years ago when the pandemic started, my husband and I got stuck in separate countries. All my books had been delayed or canceled and it felt like the right time to get introspective. I showed it to a handful of people and I was told in no uncertain terms that if I ever put this book out in the world, it would be an end to my career in all ages content, which up until then had been my main focus. So I did as I was told and I put it away and covered. Now in 2023, I wanna start putting out comics on Kickstarter, but that's a really scary prospect. And I've always said that if you want to do something scary, just do something way scarier first. The regular scary thing just seems like normal by comparison. So instead of putting out the first volume of Haunted Hill, my ongoing series, for my very first Kickstarter, I'm putting out Octopus, my memoir that I'm genuinely terrified for anyone to see. Good choices made well. <laughs> but what I can do is make it a really beautiful book because I've done that literally hundreds of times before. So I'm going to have the regular edition, I'm going to have the special limited foil stamp edition, and I'm going to be doing a sketch variant, limited to 50, where I will draw an octopus tentacle holding anything you want it to hold. So take a look through the rewards, find the one you like, and thank you so much for backing this and making the next one a whole lot less scary for me to do. Pledge now, folks. That's right. You heard it here. You heard it here. Fire, Rich. Fire. The art is dope, man. My gosh. Thank you. So, yeah. so, um, yeah, so, so this is a 144 page memoir. So talk about it, man. What what are we getting, man? Is this just this is a complete memoir or is this just a chapter in your life? It is I think it, it might be the only memoir I ever do, honestly. Um I think that there's a lot of people who want to write a memoir about why they write comics, and I don't want to read that or draw it. Um <laughs> I think that there was this particular time in my life where I was, um, you know, it's like 18 months from late 2015 to mid 2017, where I uh, was in a terribly abusive relationship with this horrible man. Um, I was like just so overwhelmed with stress and work and trying to do something new and different and just scared of re-entering the world that had kind of gone horribly wrong for me before where I'd been, uh, long story longer, in this, like, tumultuous relationship with a man I met online, uh, moved countries to be with him, found out he was secretly married the whole time, uh, everything kind of messy, then obviously did the healthy thing and kept dating him online for 10 years. Um, oh, damn, bro. And I, I didn't like a Lifetime movie, bro. <laughs> I didn't want to re-enter that world, but also I wanted to move to L.A. where he lived, and I wanted to, like, do things beyond like self-publishing comics on a small level in New Zealand. And he was like, everyone kept saying to me, um, you know, when you go, when you go to LA, do you know anyone with influence in film and TV? And I was like, I do, it's my ex and I don't want to go down that path. Um, and so it kind of all felt like everything was swirling around me. And so the book covers like, um, like, chron like chronologically, and the book's not told chronologically, it's kind of based around the themes of these turning points, but chronologically it's, I get so overwhelmed that I try to kill myself by stealing a boat uh, and follows all the way through to me moving to Hollywood and meeting someone nice and like someone who actually like sees me for the incredibly flawed person I am, but is still in like still engaged by that. And it's about me kind of hating myself less and becoming a better person as a result of that. Because like I said before, when you start, feeling shitty about yourself, you try and overcorrect and you're always just digging the grave deeper. How did you feel then, uh, emotionally then, you know, again, sharing of yourself in this project? Um, well, this is the strange thing. When I, when I started it, I did the first issue right before I did, uh, started Black Sand Beach because I had a week to kill and I'm a workaholic and I didn't really know what it was going to be. And it was just this like one story from this one night of my life. And it, it felt like very good to do. And then 
when the, when lockdown kicked in, I started a second chapter of it and then a third, and then I showed it to a handful of people. And that was when I was told, don't, don't submit this to publishers. Do not like this. You, this cannot be seen by the world. Basically you will, everything will end. Cause at this point, like right at the beginning of lockdown, I was meant to be like going on this big tour across America with black sand beach when it launched. And there was going to be a wow. podcast tie in and all that crazy shit. And of course it all went away with COVID, but um, you know, they still didn't want, like everyone said, don't put this out. And so for the, the second half of the book, I was really just trying to make the absolute best comic I could entirely for me. Um, I was stuck alone in my house trying to like explore a world pre pandemic where um, it, even though a lot of it was really hard and a lot of it is, was like, I think a lot of people look at it and go, holy shit, what an awful life. I look at it as like, what a wild adventure. And it was, it all happened so quickly that I never had time to think about whether it was good or bad. And I, I've, I've always said, like, I've never not enjoyed something in my entire life. If something is bad, I think to myself, well, imagine what a cool story this will be later. The only time I don't enjoy myself is if it's boring, right? And so mm -hmm. all of these things are sort of like there's a lot of terrible experiences that I'm enjoying myself throughout. Um, and a lot of things that I, are really wonderful, fun experiences that I'm enjoying myself throughout as well. You know, there's there 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 is a lot of making new friendships, finding new people, um, going out for karaoke right before I get overwhelmed by my work schedule and try and steal a boat. <laughs> um, so it is a, a very fun time. And as I've mentioned, I love sex clubs. So I have a lot of good times in here too. So fun. And again, look at the art style, man. Amazing. Well, why, why, why go this? struggle with the art i mean with, with shading and then it goes light to dark i mean i love it I love this black and white look off the, on a yellowish type looking page too um I, a big part of it was that i didn't um i i hate i, I can do digital coloring i hate doing it and i wanted to if i was going to do this the first chapter of if i was going to make a new book i wanted it to only involve the parts of comic making that i like so it's written fast drawn fast like with care and obsession, like, like I, I really, I'm happiest when I'm going nonstop for 20 hours at a time on a book, um, uh, because it, I like, then you're in it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to have anything that would make me have to put a page aside and come back to it later. Um, and, uh, then because it was such a scary thing to put out there, I knew that if I like, if I gave myself the option, there was always a chance that I would want to edit it or change things or remove things. So everything is written, like all the text is at hand lettering, you know, and then it's scanned as a photograph uh, rather than a, um, rather than a, what do you call it? Like a, like a regular scan. So that's why like nothing can be removed. It, it would be almost impossible to edit this book. Um, mm. And so it just, it just kind of, it, it was to force my own hand further down the line if it did ever come out. I mean, you're saying fast, and I'm looking at just the top panel, the first three panels on this page, and you know the, the face, the emote, you 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 catch what he's feeling. You do a great job at that. Thank you. Fantastic. And again, I love the line work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and, and I, 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 you know, it's the same. It's a similar style to Haunted Hill. Um, Haunted Hill's a little more refined because it's just you know three years later, but. Um, there's also the advantage that like, everyone in this book is a real person. I can, mm. you know, I have a very good memory for faces. Um, it was very hard. A lot of it, like this, this chapter on here is about the last time I saw this person who was my best friend for over a decade and my collaborator on a lot of books. Um, and he just, he destroyed that friendship in kind of in an instant and undid everything before mm. it. And um, like at that point it had been, I think, four years since I'd spoken to him. Uh, and so drawing this one, like this issue was one of the hardest things to draw. Cause like one realizing I still knew every single detail of this man's face, realizing that I, without having to even think about it, knew the layout of his house for, for the, huh. the setting. Oh, wow. um, and then having to spend like, I think, I think I, I, I got this chapter out in six days and that was a very hard six days. Um, especially because when I knew him was a point where I was, I was in my first marriage, I was particularly miserable and I was like drinking between two and four bottles of wine a day just to kind of like wow. numb everything. And, you know, I, like the temptation was, Hey, I'm back in this moment. Should I go buy a box of wine 
And fortunately, I was in lockdown, so it was really hard to do that. <laughs> Thank goodness for lockdown and that, and you don't drink yourself uh, to death. Mm. Not a good idea. Oh, man, look at the road. So here you're chilling with the homie. I like the way you draw, draw, uh, draw cars, too. This is great, man. I'm digging you. it. The look, the feel. Real nice, real slice of life type stuff, man. Because, you know, superhero stuff is... It's, of course, an entertainment and great, but sometimes you got to dig in, bro. But again, you know, thank you for putting this on page and, and sharing your story with us. No, uh, thank you for thank you for taking it seriously, I guess. It's a it's a you know, and like, look, I'm I'm always sort of torn because I remember, you know, creating a lot of comics that were um, I mean, you know, I was in art school, so I made art school comics um, and then what I was working on in the background throughout all of that was Blastosaurus. And I built my name with these like introspective comics that were explorations of what it would look like if a real person had superpowers or what would happen if a person never slept and only associated with insomniacs and like the kind of trying to create, I don't know. I did a book about, I did a comic about a sound effect. That's the dumbest thing I could have done. <laughs> and, and then like I, I finished college and then I'm like, okay, here I am I'm back. Here's Blastosaurus. And everyone who had been in my audience, like, like, yes, Blastosaurus is about a, you know, grumpy old man who wishes he wasn't shaped like a dinosaur, but it is still a crime-fighting Triceratops book. And people, like, one audience turned on me, I found a new one, and then slowly the other audience came back. And and so there's always this, like, push and pull with me where when I'm doing kid-friendly stuff, when I'm doing adult stuff, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the book I've got coming out this year from Fanbase is called Four Color Heroes, and it's it's a graphic novel about these two boys who uh, fall in love through like a shared, a shared love of a superhero comic. And um, throughout the story, one of them is from a very religious background and has been told he's never allowed to like look at things like comic books. And the other boy figures out the loophole that he can just describe them to him. So we never see the actual superhero comics. We just see them how the religious boy imagines them. And so I've spent the past uh, six months or so, like learning to draw superheroes um learning to color in a traditional superhero style and like kind of killing myself to get it right really like like these the most intense pages i've ever done the most detail i've ever and most like rigid i guess not it's not a great word but like like fluid movement but like there's a, there's, there's rules there's an understanding of muscles and anatomy and all this shit to kind of prove to myself that i could do it fortunately with the fact like with the the caveat that the character is starting to understand what superheroes look like so you get to see me learn as he learns but you oh, know this is the stuff that like i can I, I can't i can't draw it as fast as i write it but i can get pretty close and that's the most like engaged i can ever feel in the book now look at this folks look at that i love your panel layouts man your page layouts are dope are you doing this all yourself? Yeah, yeah, everything is me. Wow, you see a one band show over here, folks. You see that? I'm sorry you hear that sound. It's like, I don't know why I'm getting called when I'm off shift. Because <laughs> you're, you're very popular on Skype. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm popular everywhere, apparently. Day <laughs> job, side gig, around the way. Oh, this is a dope page, man. I love how the, the, the top over here is designed. Kind of that faded look. Kind of look, is that supposed to be like a memory? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. like, it's actually based on that parts are, uh, those parts are sort of based on photographs I have of, of the two of us together at conventions and us and our Blastosaurus hats and things. And, and you know, that was, yeah. It was, it was hard to re-examine that. It, it's, it's also weird, like now it's been two years um and i'm jesus it's been three years hasn't it uh it's been three years since i drew this and so now putting it back out there a i had to like reread it to have had to be like talking about it i mean on, on tuesday i had this amazing day because the kickstarter launched we like funded in six hours we it's me Ooh, i funded in six hours, hours. um <laughs> and it was like I should have been happier than I've ever been, but I also did like five interviews that day. I spoke for a total of seven and a half hours about my Whoa. deep and complicated feelings about this work. <laughs> I was like, by the end of the day, I was like, I'm a wreck. What what has happened? <laughs> Crazy. But again, thank you for sharing. I know that takes a lot, you know, creatively and artistically to put that out there. I mean, again, but it, it shows though that you actually you said you're sharing, so you're trying to make this perfect because the art is, is gorgeous. Thank you. 
and, and then your lettering and your letter placement as well on the store of the art. So, you know, again, and eye candy, the eye does flow, especially here, you know, like these wide, wide screen panels, love it. Yeah. Made, oh, is that what you were talking about them clubs <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep yep this is this is a centurion uh it's a sex club in auckland um that was i was trying to distract my friend because his husband was in for a biopsy that day and this is actually the day that um i met a i met an elderly sea captain um a who sea captain <laughs> i end up having like um i so i i had i used to wake up um, I'd have blackouts and I'd wake up and I'd have written don't cry work somewhere on my body. And that was what Warhol used to write all around the factory to inspire his artists. And I've had it written on the walls of like my bedroom or any studio or any office I've had uh, since I was nine. And um, so I started having these blackouts because I was so overwhelmed with work. I'd also like managed to grind my teeth to the point that I broke six of them in my sleep one night. Um, oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, workaholic, like it's, it's, but it's also why I have 270 books. Um, 270, so got, bro. Mother. So I awesome. got Good uh, I got Don't Cry Work tattooed on my arm um, here. It's hard to figure out That's where it. the webcam got. Um, just turn my arm. That, why yeah. I put it on my anyway, so I have that there, and I stopped having the blackouts. And then about two years after that, I started getting very, very stressed again. And I woke up one day, and I was in the bathtub and the water was black and I couldn't figure out why. And it was because a bottle of ink had dropped into the water and I had in my like blacked out state written the words, uh, get to see on my chest. Um, which is if you've read Moby Dick in the introduction, he says like when you're fed up with the world, get to see, um, yeah. what's very upsetting about this. This is also the motivation behind, uh, Rory Gilmore stealing a boat in Gilmore girls. And I really hate that my subconscious was so linked <laughs> to that. Um, and then like my friend, I woke up in the bathtub because my friend was at the door being like, you want to go out into this fuck club. And that was the day that I met the sea captain who then told me when he's like, the reason he became a sea captain was because when he got fed up with the world, he would get to sea. Um, and so two days later, while well, I was in Melbourne at a comic convention and I'd gone out for karaoke with all the comic people. And then my phone was dead and it was like, early hours of the morning and I was by a river and I thought I should just steal a boat right now and disappear. That seems a lot easier than uh, contacting my ex to see if he can introduce me to people in Hollywood. Oh, wow. um, and I failed at boat theft. It turns out I can't untie knots very well. So I just kind of like rocked back and forth across the river. <laughs> so you were trying. You, you, yeah. you, need, you need a Puerto Rican next to you. They always have a knife. <laughs> Puerto Rican, I could say that. All right, folks. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad That's you fun. clarified for your own sake for the internet. <laughs> um, so they, you know, yeah, wanna, so, you know, people get offended real quick. You know? <laughs> so that was, um, yeah, that, that this is the sex club where I met the sea captain, um, who I use a fake name for because he gave me his real name and that felt like an overshare. Um, we're actually, we're doing a, we, me, I am, uh, I'm doing a stretch goal, which hasn't been announced yet, um, where if we reach a certain level, I'm going to have an add on available where you can buy a notebook, a copy of a notebook that has handwritten follow ups for all of the men in the stories. Because, like, there's some buck wild shit that went down that I, I didn't have room or thematically didn't fit. You know, there's, yeah, there's a scene in chapter four where I'm coming back from this trip to upstate New York visiting Jim, the unapologetic dirtbag I talked about. Uh, and uh, we had this weird weekend, like we had this big falling out because he doesn't believe in ghosts and he lives in a haunted post office. And then like we'd broken into a house together and uh, went like and explored this cave and it was a whole thing. And um, I was coming back to, to Penn Station on the train and I was feeling like very, uh, I was absolutely convinced that like my adventures were over and I was never going to have like another great time in my life, uh, which is stupid. And then the minute I get off the train, this guy sees my coat, approaches me, starts very forcefully shaking my hand, congratulating me on what a great coat I have. And then five minutes later, he's like giving me champagne and a hand job in the back, like one of the back offices <laughs> of the station. And, um, you know, it's just like a nice moment. You know, it was, it was just a fun re reminder that these cool things can happen and do. Um, if you, if you say yes, when someone says, Hey, do you like champagne? Do you want to come to my, my, my office? Um, 
<laughs> and then, so but random shit, months, bro. That's funny shit, bro. But oh six months God. later, I'm uh, out at, uh, uh, watching a documentary at the movie theater with this other guy, this like philanthropist surfer who emailed me randomly one day, who I still don't know how I know him, but he was like, Richard, I'm in town. Let's have dinner. And then when I saw him, he was like, it's so good to see you again. Gave me a big hug. I have no idea. You're like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> uh, I, live, I live in a hotel with him for a month. And uh, the last night that I, that he was there, I took him to see this documentary. And at the end of the documentary, which I'm not going to say what it is, because people have to get the, will have to get that book when the add-on gets added, because it's <laughs> worth it. Um, it's a really fucking dark documentary that has a villain at the core of it. And the documentary is about finding out who that villain is. And at the very end, when they confront the villain, I say, oh, shit, that's the handjob guy from the train station. <laughs> and like, oh, man, you know, my, my friend has said to me multiple times that my butthole has been a camping ground for villains. Um, <laughs> oh, shit. But. That's not like a super villain <laughs> that you can make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, trap the heroes. <laughs> the, the good news is the guy is dead now. And I can like, it's rare that I can say it's good. This person is dead. Um, the terrifying part is that the evil shit he was doing is now is now active again. And no one knows who's doing it this time. So okay. it's kind of fucking wild. And let's talk about when people start pitching into this, you know, crazy wild book. Because I like that idea, though. Uh, it's like the cutting room floor stuff. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I dig it. All right, so you got this. What's octopus on the bottle? When I saw this, what is this? Let me let me grab one. So, like, I'm assuming you're a man of the world. You know what poppers are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Poppers. Here's here's a real bottle of poppers for comparison. Um, this is a liquid. Uh, used to be amyl nitrate, now is usually isobutyl or isopentyl uh, nitrate. And you sniff it, and it gets you super fucking horny, euphoric, and uh, will relax certain muscles in your body for ease of entry. Um, it is a fantastic drug that that everyone should enjoy. Uh, if you're in America, you can get it for about 10 bucks a bottle at most smoke shops. It features heavily in the book, okay? Obviously, like, in my life, I use it a fair amount. Um, uh, my my friend who said that my butthole was a camping ground for villains also once said that my my butthole was a renewable resource because it seemed to give men energy. Um, oh shit! <laughs> so I have produced octopus in a bottle, a fake bottle of poppers that looks just like a real one with my own branding. And when you open it, rather than getting fun, sexy times, you get some horny ass digital comics. So you'll get a code uh, <laughs> to get the uh, entire memoir. Uh, on a password protected site, as well as um, 250 pages of like my back catalog of unavailable stuff, including oh, wow. the horny ass Blastosaurus story where uh, my co writer fucks him because <laughs> it turns out he's a <laughs> Triceratobottom. A Triceratobottom. Oh my God. Oh, the, the names, man. I could see this is some real dark, dark cartoon. It'd be really funny shit, bro. You should, you should think Thanks. about that. So, all right. So, the foil cover is fire. Thank you. I'm digging that, yo. So what is that idea? You only have 100 copies, to folks. You see that? Only 100 copies. Yep. Um, and I have the... Where is it? Let me grab that. I have, I have a one. free copy somewhere. My office is kind of a mess right now. Maybe I can't find it. I thought I could. That would have been so much better if I could. Okay, well, I can't. So... Oh, no, there it is. Oh, sweet. Look, proof copy. So you can see that it's real and it exists. And look how Ooh. shiny that is. Um, oh, it's a thick book too, man. Look at it that. is 144 pages on very nice Look paper. That. Um, and then on the back, I'm I'm doing a little practice of uh, sketching an octopus tentacle holding. Like this is the sketch cover will be octopus tentacle holding whatever you want. So I wanted to make sure the paper oh, was cool. nice and worked with my pens. So yeah, but it's like and does, the book looks oof. fucking nice. Like all of the the photographing Folks. instead of drawing and then the color still really pops even on the it's it's all wood free paper yeah. so yeah it's it's a nice damn book and it's heavy oh shit it feels good to hold oh there you go folks that that book look look this is what you gotta do folks you want that that sexy book you just pulled out you know what i mean all you gotta do is spend ten dollars you could do that without a reward because you're a nice person you got ten dollars to spare but of course you want a digital copy of that bad boy starts as low as ten bucks all right and then for 20, what's that? A collection bottle. A that, digital that's, yeah, that's the octopus in a bottle. 
And that one's really good for uh, international backers because I know like shipping's insane now, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the octopus in a bottle can ship internationally for much less than a book. So you still get a collectible item, which I think people really want, but and you still get the entire comic to read. Uh, and the real advantage is if you're going to have like a real big night and someone's about to ram jam something right up there, you can reach for that bottle and be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know, and I was thinking about the shipping. Maybe you should hire some homing pigeons. It'd probably be really cheaper. You could tie the bottle and they just deliver. Well, the, the good part is, um, <laughs> because I I split my time between the U.S. and Canada. Um, there's none of that like insane crossing the border costs. Um, so like shipping to U.S. and Canada okay. are both at like the lowest possible price, as if I'm just there, um, which is nice. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And look, folks, now if you want to hold that glory in your yeah. hands, 28 bucks it starts for the regular cover and the digital cover. So that way you don't put fingerprints all over it. <laughs> <laughs> so the I, is, there, there's a, an ongoing argument on in indie comic Twitter about uh, whether or not people should write for the page turn because, like, so many comics are now scrolling. Do you need to think about where your pages are going to be lying in the print book? And um, the I did a Haunted Hill uh, cover. Everyone was telling me do sexy covers, right? And everyone was like, you got to do those covers that just have a lady with her titties out, set, standing awkwardly as if she's fully dressed, because usually it's just a layer that gets removed from the file. And I was like, if I'm going to do a sexy cover, I'm going to do the gayest sexy cover I possibly can. So <laughs> when I do the Haunted Hill campaign, this is this is an exclusive for you. When I do the Haunted Hill campaign, the sexy variant is Eva cleaning the floor at Slamtown, surrounded by the like an enormous orgy. There's 29 dicks just shooting cum everywhere, <laughs> including onto the logo of the book. All the cum has uh, spot UV treatment, so it's glossier than the rest of the cover. It's going to be the nicest thing. I didn't do a sexy cover for this book because I don't think anyone wants to see me with my you know, dick and balls and everything. <laughs> On display, <laughs> you could you could have blacked it out and just holding the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> that's idea for next time. Well, there you go. Oh, you got the add-ons and pins too. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so awesome. yeah, cute little right. pins. So you can like, as I say in there, like wear these pins to your to wear the bottle of poppers as a pin, so you can explain to your grandmother what they are at Christmas dinner. <laughs> hey, grandma, you want to experiment, with grandpa? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> And we're going to get into a grandpa question in a little bit before we go. But before that, let's finish this up. Over here, folks, 100 copies of this baby, 45 bucks. I think that's that's awesome for collectors, yo. Right here. You get the dope foil cover you saw. 75 bucks. Did you have a, a sketch cover? Dope. Look at that. Limited to 40, 50. You already have five people taking you up on that offer. Great. Nice. All gone on the early bird book, of course. You had 39 yeah. backers that jumped all over this baby, like white on rice. Awesome. As they I should. I really I, I haven't been like keeping track of who's backing what. I just keep track of how many how many I have in total and how much they're spending. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, like, just give me the money. No, like, this is great. Well, look, this is you know, this is my first Kickstarter, so it's sort of terrifying. Um like fortunately I've done enough self-publishing I've done enough like distribution and stuff that I know I can handle the fulfillment in my sleep. Like that's, that's old school to me. Yeah. Um, but the, the idea of putting something like this out onto the internet and having people like, re like respond to it when it's not just a free comic up on a website or whatever um, has been yeah. terrifying, but also huge that it's, that it seems to be working. And this is going to be this and conventions are my entire path forward within comics from now on, I think, because Excellent. like I've been doing this full time for a very long time. And I think I can like I can make it work. Good. But exactly. Manifest it. Keep that positivity and, and self-encouragement. And you got this. Of course, you're going to make it. You're an amazing uh, creator. I don't see. I mean, again, look at this. Your first Kickstarter. You should be very proud of yourself, man, to, to, to achieve that. Almost double the goal when you still got 29 days. My gosh, bro. That's a big Thank achievement, you. man. So congrats, man. I'm really, I'm really happy since since the last time we spoke to see this. You know, great, great, great to see you keep moving forward. Now, we're going to be talking uh, uh, about conventions as well, uh, where you're going to be at. But with this, again, folks, let me repeat last time before we get into those other topics. You have 29 days to go. So just pledge away. Pledge away. Make it rain and rich. All right? And I've got the easiest website in the world, kickrichard.com. 
And that will be my forever home for all my crowdfunding stuff. And there it is for kick rich. It's so easy. Dot com. All right. And of course, I got all the links below. So all you got to do is just click away. I make your life easy, folks. All right. Now, with that, let, let's get uh, in, into a question that I told him I was going to ask. I, I found it hysterical. I was thinking as soon as I saw the movie, you popped into my head. I was like, oh, shit, I don't know what this dude thinks. <laughs> so last time you were on the show, you, you, you profess your great love for, for uh, the, uh, the uh, grandpa monster. Yeah, Al Lewis, sexiest man who's ever lived. <laughs> um, did, did and now they've done a remake, bro. Uh, well, so here, here's the thing. My yeah. my love of Al Lewis starts when I'm seven years old. We didn't have the monsters in New Zealand at that point, right? Uh, but we did have this New Zealand-made film called Grampire. It is Grandpire. one of the most boring films I've ever seen, but I've seen it like 200 times because I just cannot stop looking at this man. And I like my earliest sex dreams are like this. This is like early in my life that my sex dreams are me blowing Grandpire hidden under oh his cape. God. And if I do a good job, he levitates. <laughs> um, so I've had this like, 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 look, my crushes on old men start with like Master Splinter, the oldest of the gummy bears, Hudson from Gargoyles, and then straight to Grandpire. And like, <laughs> My, like, my husband is, he's 77, he's 40 years older than me. Uh, he dressed as a vampire for our wedding day. Like, this is a, a continuing thing, right? Um, and I, when I started seeing the monsters, when I was about 11 or 12, I was like, just obsessed. And I would just, I would record episodes and just only watch his scenes. Um, I didn't have the internet yet. Did not even know about Silver Daddies or olderforme.com. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I just, Oh, everything. So then when this movie gets announced and like, you know, there's like, there have been other versions of the monsters. There's that very bad film from the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. There was 1313 Mockingbird, which I actually thought was really fucking cool, but like Eddie is are not sexy to me. Um, far too young. And so then when this one gets announced and it's like, okay, we it's all zombie, went, right? we all went through a Rob Zombie phase. We all did. Yeah. Like we can't pretend we didn't. We loved the song Dragula. We loved the remix of it on the Matrix soundtrack. You know, it was that tough choice in 1999. Do you get Hellbelly Deluxe or do you buy Kid Rock's record? You got to make. <laughs> we all faced that conundrum in a record store, but the Kid Rock one came with a free T-shirt. So cool. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> That was the same year I bought Power Man 5000s oh, tonight, the Star Wars Revolt. I didn't have, like, it was like, oh my the, God. the music that I oh. liked then, like, it was so diverse. It was like, I was heavily into Marcy Playground and Power Man 5000. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> um i actually i saw marcy playground a couple of years ago and there were like 11 people at the concert and it was the saddest thing i've ever stood through um anyway here the Rob Zombie's doing this this monsters movie, and I'm not excited. Um, I know what his aesthetic is, and it's not it's not clean and suave. It's not, yeah. and it's 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 like it's garish in a way that doesn't feel grimy. And I like grimy, you know. Mm -hmm. I I love Hollywood because I don't have to look up when I'm walking down the street because there's such a specific piss smell when I have to turn the corner to get to my office. <laughs> um, I don't like the lurid colorful grimy that always it always reminds me of like you know when you hear those stories about where governments will come in and paint the slums bright colors before the olympics so it like looks good on tv mm -hmm. um that's what rob zombie's aesthetic feels like to me mm -hmm. and it feels like he's making up for a lack of story and poor directing in that film uh with i don't know bright colors and swirly lights and then on top of that the most important thing that that version of Sam Dracula is not sexy. He is not a sexy man. He does nothing for me. He's not a cute, friendly fella. He's just like a big, over the top sort of like I don't even know. I feel like like I feel like I'm 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 stumbling into a civil war reenactment when I look at his facial <laughs> hair. Uh, just everything about it just bummed me out. Um, I do not want to be under his cape. And also, here's the thing. I, I'm a polite person. <laughs> Out of respect, I would still blow him. He is still Grandpa Munster. And, you know, it's, 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 like, it's like, you know, 
if you've made the decision that you never want to be fisted, but if Jim Henson offered, you'd have to do it for th- like thematic synergy. <laughs> um, obviously, I would still anyone who is no, I, now. Now I'm imagining Jim Henson with a human puppet, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he says it's terrible. It's the thing that Ernie and Bert had in common. They both left their hands <laughs> their asses. You're fucking hysterical. This guy is um, so yeah, no, I, I I was not a fan. I was not enthused by that film. And I honestly I watched the first 20 minutes and I just couldn't stand it. I think that's most people uh uh, uh feeling on it. <laughs> so yeah. That was even mine. I was like, ah, oh, nah. I, I, I'm I? a master guest. I, I I try to endure things that I, I might not enjoy just just for the sake of being fair to say okay I watched it and give some real natural thought. It's just not I couldn't do that. Yeah. There was there's a couple of movies I just I just can't I, I can't later. <laughs> did you did, did I did I last time did I tell you my grandpire story? Well, it's, well, for, it's those, for those new listeners, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so I put out this book called Irrelevant. It's about a vampire who used to be cool. And um, I was selling it at a convention, and this guy comes up, and he's looking through it, and he's laughing. And um, I say, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and I sort of said, like, a little bit inspired by Grandpire, obviously, but it's just little gags um, as opposed to the big gag that I'd hoped for. And um, he he said, oh, Grandpire, I worked on that. And I was like, what? really? And he said, oh, and he said yeah. <laughs> you know Al Lewis was a swinger? And then he fucking turned and disappeared into the crowd. I got no follow-up. He was like, wait, and he just disappeared. Like, shh. Uh-huh. <laughs> wait. I don't know if it's true. Like, you know, I, I have no idea if it's true. Um, I'm happier believing it's true uh, for obvious <laughs> reasons. But, you know, it's it's like, it's. That's my, hysterical. My friend sent me an article the other day because William Daniels, who played Mr. Feeney, his wife made some like statements recently that, like, their open marriage was really like hurtful to her back in the seventies. And my friend just like, since, like so many of my friends have sent me this article being like, Hey, you know, William Daniels is down to clown. I'm like, he's still straight though. Okay. okay. He's still straight. Yes. Obviously I want to have sex with Mr. Feeney if I can, <laughs> but like, it's that's probably never going to happen. Mr. Feeney, wow. That's crazy. Shit, All right, my brother. So let's do this folks. Again, it's humor. So you're going to catch a lot of this crazy humor, too. And his stories are wild and fun, entertaining. I mean, I, I can't stop laughing. This guy, your energy, bro, and your stories. I, you got you got to do a show on this or a movie one day and just share it I, like yeah. that. I, I, that'll be funny. I'm going to do a lot of thing. things. I Like, look, I, I can't talk about it too much. Um, there's, there's some shit coming down the line that's very exciting. What I can mm-hmm. tell you, sneak preview. So it's Octopus right now. Haunted Hill Volume 1 will be on Kickstarter in, I think, May. Uh, my new graphic novel, The Ex-Wives of Frankenstein, uh, will be, I think, Ooh. August. And then uh, a horror story about uh, grief called uh, The Lights That Guide You Home will be in, I think, October. So oh, wow. there's, there's big stuff coming. And there's new Haunted Hill coming soon as well. Like, I, I just finished issue 13. So that will be kicking off again as soon as I can, like, knock out the last Black Sand Beach book. Wow. You hear this? You hear this, folks? This guy is a hustler smashing it and making his dreams come true, doing what he got to do to make sure that, you know, he, he stays on the lane that he has chosen, which is to F everybody. I'm doing this shit type joint. So I love that mentality. That's right. You, you got to follow Richard on social, on Twitter. You go to Richard Fairgrave, Instagram. Richard Fairgrave, author. The website is richardfairgrave.com. Most importantly, it's his current Kickstarter. Let's make it rain on him. Let's get this like to ten thousand dollars right now, right? That's Before the dream, over. Right? Let Kirk. It's kickrichard.com. So simple, kickrichard.com. Yep. And, and it's like below. keep you checking that. All, all my campaigns will be through that. And if I have no campaign going, I'm devel- so okay. I'm in talks with someone who wants to put together a flash game where when I have no campaigns going, you can just go and do uh, and actually play a game where you get to kick me. Um, <laughs> where depending if if you if you kick me too hard, I move across the screen and I'm able to reach a bottle of poppers, at which point I sniff them and then when you kick me, your foot gets lost in my bottle. <laughs> So that's that's what's being developed right now. I don't know if it's gonna work. That sounds like Red's nightmare when he puts his foot up somebody's ass. <laughs> and he's gonna be gone. <laughs> yeah, 
I was so I, okay. So I started watching that '90s show because, like, I take 12 minutes off each morning for breakfast, and I just watch TV yeah. late. And um, there's this bit in the first episode where Topher Grace actually like says, like, he acts like Red, and he says to his daughter, like, yeah. "I because I will put my foot up your ass." And when Red says it, it feels like a normal parenting threat from the '70s. When Topher Grace says it uncomfortably, it sounds like he's describing like a literal action he wants to take, and it's so. <laughs> right. It's it's like oh it squicked me out hard to yeah. hear that. But I did love oh, the moment. Yeah. However, it was like I, I've never been prouder. <laughs> it was funny. You know what? It, it, it's not a bad remake. It's not. It's not the greatest. No, it's but fine. you know, I, it's I, I, but I think it's fun for what it is with the kids and all. Fun approach. Um, you know, they, I, I'm a '90s kid myself, so I, yeah. I see a lot of stuff from the '90s in it, which is true. Uh, which is funny. So I was like, oh, I could appreciate yeah. this for I, what it is. I'm like, I I get bothered by the anachronisms like they there's a line in an episode where they refer to uh their her mom getting her groove back and it's like yeah okay but yeah how stella got her groove back is until 98 and this is 95 mm -hmm. um but there's also here's the thing that really bugs me about it they're trying to make it feel like a sitcom right so they have a laugh track and it's clearly a track it's not a live studio audience obviously um and whenever a character shows up who has been on the show in you know, the original show they have everyone cheer and then the actor has to stand there doing that like awkward live performance of waiting for the cheering to die down before they deliver their cameo <laughs> line and it's just awful because like okay we yeah. know this isn't real though you're cheering for you're hitting a button that says hey good for us right pause pause for a moment while this cheering is on <laughs> yeah yeah oh man i i get that it, it is you know fake it is it, the old school like man with children every time i used to walk mm -hmm. in or pay you right yeah that that momentary pause okay let the all right yeah let me yeah everyone now on my life. whenever christina <laughs> applegate walked in i mean i would um, love that to happen in real life like we all want the the whole of external validation from serena the teenage witch but like i don't want it on my tv shows yeah yep you know uh, and you're gonna anyway, I'm sorry. I shouldn't talk about sitcoms. You're, you're clearly trying to wrap <laughs> things up, and I'm just like, let me tell you a story about my feelings on a sitcom. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's cool. Be, uh, again, I, I love your energy, man. You like talking, and again, you know, you will have a sitcom. This is why I segue that way because this will turn into a sitcom one day. Never know, yeah, bro. Well, I want, right? you know, I grew up on shows like Doctor Cats and Home Movies. I want, I want to bring back shows that are just like technically funny. Yes, please. Because yeah. nothing, you know, don't nothing be like, don't be like Night Court. Don't be like Night Court, this new yeah. one. Now that that was oh come on, yeah, man. That was bad. I just want like things that are like <laughs> you hear a thing, you're like, oh, that's technically a joke, I understand. And then you hear another one ten seconds later, and you're like, okay, it's a little bit funny. And by the time you hear like the 50th joke in five minutes, you can't help but be laughing because there's just it's a war of attrition against your sense of humor. Yeah. And that is like that is what those kind of shows did. Um when it like I don't know, I I just I just love those very small jokes that when when there's enough of them, you get worn down. Yeah. Yep. Yep, the old, the old school way. Unfortunately, that's not how it is nowadays. No, all no, right, it's folks. All, it's all bullshit. Yeah, man. So there we go, folks. That's follow this man. As you can see, he got stories for you. Wonderful entertainment. Great spirit. Support, support, support. Independent creators like Rich, because he's on his way. He told everybody, gave him the middle finger. He's on his way. So he's a, it's a great example of someone that just, you know, just is doing it. His first Kickstarter, as you saw already, fully funded. And it's just make it rain even further, see how far it could go. So, you know, be like rich and get it done. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate y'all. Comiccrusaders.com, undercovercapes.com. You know what it is. Hasta la próxima, mi gente. Much love. Whippa! Thank you for listening to the. Be nice in my house. Thank you for listening to the Comic Crusaders podcast. If you like the content, please subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, please visit ComicCrusaders.com and our extended podcast family over at UndercoverCapes.com. 